Okay, well, so, um, as I was saying, we are diving into a, a difficult topic uh, today, uh, talking about sin. So if you read uh, this chapter, which last week a lot of, a lot of you told me, you, you ratted yourselves out, but you told me you're not reading this book. So again, shame on you, this is a fantastic book, it really is. And these, these, short, these chapters are really pretty short. And so Stott goes into the fact and nature of sin here in chapter 5. And he does a, a, he does a really uh, an, an interesting and very helpful thing, I think, in walking through the Ten Commandments in particular and, um, and unpacking the nature of those commandments and then their implications for what it means in our relation to God as far as sin goes. And so I would encourage you, again, to read the whole book, but especially this chapter is really, really helpful in uh, the material on um, on the Ten Commandments. And so, because he does such a good job, I'm not going to kind of recover that ground. I, I wanted to do something a little different today as we think and talk about uh, the fact and the nature of sin. And so, uh, I want to begin just uh, with a, a quote from a, a theologian named Cornelius Plantinga. Um, He's a, a guy I respect a lot. He's got a book um, on sin that's called, I love the title. The title of this book is called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. Not the way it's supposed to be. That's the way he titles his book on sin. And so here's, here's how he begins um, in the preface of this book. He says, in this book, I'm trying to retrieve an old awareness that has slipped and has changed in recent decades. And he's writing this book some uh, probably 10 or 20 years ago. So you would think um, how many things have changed even more uh, since that time. So he says he's trying to retrieve an old awareness that slipped and changed. He says, the awareness of sin used to be our shadow. Christians hated sin. They feared it. They fled from it. They grieved over it. Some of our grandparents maybe even agonized over their sins. A man who lost his temper during the week might wonder whether he could still receive Holy Communion on Sunday. A woman who for years had envied her more attractive and intelligent sister might worry that this sin threatened her very salvation. But, he says, but the shadow has dimmed. Nowadays, the accusation that you have sinned is often said with a grin or with a tone that sort of signals an inside joke. And so a, a particularly painful example of this um, happens when uh, Pastor, this happens a few years ago, Pastor John Piper is speaking to um, the American Association of Christian Counselors. And so if you don't know anything about John Piper, um, he is um, an intense, uh, super serious preacher in the tradition of, say, Jonathan Edwards. And uh, Jonathan Edwards was a fantastic theologian, uh, president of Yale uh, University way back in the day. Um, but most people know Jonathan Edwards from his famous sermon that you learn in high school English classes, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And so Piper is cut from that bowl, from that cloth. Uh, if you will. So he's super serious, super intense, um, and that's, that's, that's his thing. And so Piper is speaking before this, this uh, large uh, body um, of the American Association of Christian Counselors, and I've just seen a YouTube video, but it seems like there's probably a couple thousand people in the room. It's a, it's a large group um, of counselors at this professional, national, professional meeting. And so in the first uh, five minutes of his message, this is his, his introduction, uh, Piper is expressing, and just really, again, if you know him, if you've seen him or heard him before, you, you, you recognize this about him, but he's expressing just very earnestly, very transparently, very honestly, his own sins. And he's, he's getting ready to preach and speak to a, a, a congregation or a, a gathering of, uh, of Christian counselors. And so he's, he's basically saying, of all people to, to speak to, you folks know the condition of my heart. You know what human hearts are like. You know the wickedness and the deceitfulness and the self-deception that can, can happen in human hearts. And so he is, he is going on in, in really serious and somber terms um, to confess sins like narcissism, like pride, like the fear of man, fearing what other people would think about him. He confesses his failings as a husband and is, is sharing, you know, I've been in Christian counseling for the last he said three years uh, just to address some things in my marriage I'm not, I'm not doing right and so he's confessing all these things and he kind of gets to the end of that period of confession he says I just want to say before you today that I'm a, I'm a sinner and he, and he says it 
And then something just bizarre happens. I, 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 I toyed with the idea of just playing the video, but I thought, eh, it might take too much time. Now that I've told the story, maybe it'd just be better to show the people about that. But anyway, but, but something bizarre happens. They, they erupt when he says that word. He's done this serious, somber confession, and he, and he comes and he says, I'm a sinner. Rather than sitting in sort of stunned, weighty silence at that moment, they erupt literally into laughter. That, and, and here's what's going on. They don't know what to make of him. And you know, who knows how the whole conference was set up and who preceded him and all this. So maybe, maybe that's part of it. But, but they erupt into laughter when he says, I'm a sinner, and after he has confessed all those things. They're just laughing, hysterical. I mean, you can hear it on the video. They're just laughing. Instead of contemplating, even thinking about their own sinfulness, they're just, <laughs> they're just literally laughing out loud just at this guy. They think he is doing this bit as so often preachers do, right? Opening up with a joke to kind of warm up the audience and put people at ease. And, that, and by the way, that's not Piper's style at all, right? He's not going to open with a joke or ever do any of that. Um, and so I think that that, but it, it, it goes on. I mean, you, can, you can watch this. But it goes on and on. And it's like a sitcom where he'll say something and they'll laugh, but it's almost like the laugh track has been imposed over the teaching. And, and Piper just has this bizarre look, it's like this confused look on his face. And then someone even goes after them and says, why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? This is not meant to be a joke. And they just laugh all the more. It's, it's bizarre. But I think in some ways that episode is a modern illustration of the, what that quote by Planted is giving him. We think about sin. And when someone talks about their sinfulness and even makes open profession, open confession of sin, we treat that lightly. We think, oh, well, that's not something that's meant for public consumption. Even if we believe it doctrinally, even if we say it, that's not something that we would publicize. So when we do it in a, kind of an open manner, it just gets treated as a joke. We just don't, and we've lost a category as a church for open, brutally honest confession of sin and and ultimately, I think, that, again, just imagine if I was sitting there in that room with those people laughing at him, it's much easier to laugh at the notion of sin than to reflect and deal with the possibility that sin is actually lurking in each and every one of us. And so I think, that, so this morning we're going to, as, as with, with that in, in mind, kind of to, the, to set the table, I, I want us to kind of think about three aspects of sin. This morning we're looking at the, the sinfulness of sin. Um, what am I? The sinfulness of sin, the nature of sin, and then the universality of sin is, is kind of where we're going. But, but what I want to talk about, especially in line of the first thing, is just the, the sinfulness of sin. And that's what I think we have lost in the church, right? This is not something for our culture, right? I mean, the culture, of course, they're they're lost. They're you know, sitting uh, up a storm by our perspective, and they're enjoying it, right? But what else would folks who don't know Christ do, right? I mean, what else did you do when you didn't know Christ, right? And so let's eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow or someday eventually we'll die. But while we're here on earth, live it up. The, the stupid phrase from a few years back that was popular in youth culture, YOLO, right? You only live once. So live it up. Do what you want to, right? And so, of course, the world does that. The world is not the problem. The, the church is the problem. The church is the place where we don't take sin seriously. And that's because I think we have got to recover what we've lost, which is a conception of the sinfulness of sin. The sinfulness of sin, if that's not redundant and oxymoron. So, I want to leave with a quote as we think about what is sin. This comes from a, a uh, I, I don't always quote uh, old church confessions, but when I do, I quote the Belgian Confession from the mid-16th century. So this is a confession of faith from saints who have gone before us. And here's their definition of sin. I think it's good. Um, they say, sin is a corruption of the whole human nature. Our whole human nature, every aspect of what it means to be us, to be human, is corrupt. And sin is so vile and so enormous in God's sight that it is enough to condemn the whole human race. That's what sin is. That's how sinful sin is. It's so vile, it's so enormous that all of us, and not just us in this room, but on this globe, all six some odd billion, approaching seven billion of us on this globe right now at this moment, and all who have lived before us, 
and all who will live after us are under God's holy condemnation because of our sin. So that's what sin is. It's not often noticed, I don't think, uh, if you want to turn your Bibles, you, you're welcome to, to, to John 3, 16. It's not often noticed that this verse that's so well loved, and have rightfully so, this verse that's so well loved is, is situated in the context of God's wounding judgment. It's one of the most evangelistic, hopeful passages in Scripture, but we do it in disservice if we take it out of its context. Here's what God's Word says, John 3, 16, on down to verse 21. Then I want to pick up the last verse of the chapter. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him and should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen, right? Those are your Bibles. Let's go, right? That's not where it ends. For, verse 17, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but check this now, verse 18, Check this. Whoever does not believe, whoever does not believe in the Son, is condemned already. Right? So for every person, again, we've got all seven billion on the globe and all those who have come before us and all the mattress, every person who is not believing in the Son is already condemned. That's what the scripture says. Already condemned because of our sinfulness, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, verse 19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So that's what you see in our world. You see people loving the darkness that they're in. And again, let's not be so, uh, so super spiritual here on a Sunday morning to think that this wasn't us. I don't know at what point in time you came to, to faith in Christ in your life, if indeed you have a kind of faith in Christ. But there was a, probably a season in your life when you loved sin, when you embraced sin, when it was fun. Indeed, the scripture says that sin is pleasurable for a season, right? So it is pleasurable for a season. In the end, it leads to death, right? But it is pleasurable for a season. And so that's where um, people apart from Christ are. They love the darkness rather than the light, because it works with evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, unless his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out of God. And then skipping a whole, a whole lot of things all the way down to the end of the chapter, uh, John wraps this up by saying in verse 36, he says, whoever believes in the Son, this is a summary statement, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. And check this last phrase. But the wrath of God remains on them. The wrath of God remains on him. So again, the, the key word there is remain, right? In other words, it always has been. From the moment of birth, God's wrath has been upon us because from the moment of our birth, we were sinful. As much as I, I hate to use my own kid as an illustration of this, but as much as we love Kinley, as, as precious and as dear as she is, from a very early, I mean, she's a year old now, but from even earlier than that, you can, you can tell sinful instincts in her that do not square with God's holy law, right? Just a, a selfish bent, right? I want what I want now. Even this morning, uh, bless her, she woke up and she was hungry. And I was trying to review um, this lesson and, and finish the, the finishing touches on it. Uh, Jan is trying to sleep in just a little bit. So I'm, I got the house myself and I'm all quiet. And then Kimley's up. And she doesn't want to just play with her toys and just amuse herself. She wants daddy to pay attention to her and to feed her, right? And so, again, just that, that impulse, it's all about me all about me and that's the essence of sin even in the church when we when we think about the things that we celebrate and i'm just painting broad brush strokes here of our kind of christian american church think about songs that maybe you hear on the radio um, and i would encourage you to listen to the songs with this sermon um, but we we like to celebrate the loving mercy of god don't we sing about god's love that motivates us, that encourages us. Our Christian radio stations say, come listen to us, because we are positive and encouraging, and we will make you feel 
good because we know that your life is hard and your job is bad. And so what you need is encouragement and positivity. But we fail to recognize the true news of the good news of the gospel when we do that. When we just focus on His love and mercy and understand what He has rescued us from. And also when we don't think about God's transcendent holiness. We instead focus only on His love. And so Jesus says, I think interestingly in Luke um, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, He's there just teaching the disciples um, as, he, um, as He does. And there's been this, this little encounter uh, with the Pharisees preceding all this. And He says in verse 4, um, to them, he says, listen, I'm telling you, my friends, I tell you, my friends, he says, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. I think especially in our culture today, this is where we are at as Christians, as our, as our culture, and we're doing this whole game series, it's been so helpful, it's been helpful for me, Jan, I hope it's been helpful for you guys, but, but we're in a place now where I think for the first time, at least if you've grown up in Christian America, where there's like some fear, it's like, I you know, am I going to lose my job because well, I, I'm carrying a Bible to work? Right. Am I going to lose my job because I profess faith in Christ and I you know, disagree with you know, the whole stance on, on sexual ethics? So now that there's some, there's a little bit of fear and anxiety, queasiness setting in, but, but God, Jesus is saying into the midst of that and other things, he's saying, look, don't fear those who can kill the body and after that they can't do anything else. Verse 5, I will warn you, I will tell you who to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. He's saying, ultimately, your fear is to be before God. Fear God as the one who is the righteous judge. The one day will hold all things to account. And, and praise God that there is a God who will someday do that. How depressing it must be to be atheistic and to see all the evil and all the mess in the world and to literally think that there is no accountability for that. That is a sad thought, my friends, to see child abuse, to see sexual abuse, to see poverty and hunger, to see oppression, slavery, to see those things and to think, well, we're just here by a cosmic accident, and it's a shame that these things happen. No, we believe as Christians that one day there will be accountability for those things. Not just for those things indeed, but for the things that we commit as well. But ultimately, the diagnosis of us as sinners um, comes back to the end of, verse, uh, of Romans chapter 3. Uh, not the end of it, but when he's making this transition, he says, ultimately, there is no fear of God before our eyes. There is no fear of God before our eyes, and that is the diagnosis of our sinful hearts. We don't fear God, and so therefore, we do whatever we want to. We fear the disapproval of our coworker or our spouse, or our friends, or the people in our kids' school, or whoever it is. We fear their disapproval more than we fear God. David Platt, who's now our president of the International Mission Board of Southern Baptist, he says, we live in a dangerous religion, an era of dangerous religious dullness to sin. We are desensitized, he says. We can sit for hours in front of the TV or a movie listening to God's name in vain. It doesn't even register with us. We can gossip. We call it normal. Church with our minds wander on the internet, our imagination, lust, impurity. We think, well, that's just the way that men are today, right? That's just what it means to be a man, right? We just Everybody does lustful things, and so that's just the way we are. We run after greed, we run after status, we run after success and money, just like everybody else in our culture. He concludes, he says, we need to wake up and pray that God will wake us up to weep over sin, to grieve against our offense against God, to hate sin, to run from it, to want to be a part of a people who are fighting and hating and killing sin and don't want to treat sin casually. And that's exactly the problem again, just thinking about the sinfulness of sin. We live in a day and age where sin is casual. We know that we're sinners, all of us are, and it's become something that we just treat lackadaisically, flippantly, casually. And our hearts are growing more and more callous towards um, God's law and what we ought to be. We are desperately in our age in need of the sense of God's holiness Remember, God is the one who, his eyes are too pure to look on sin. Uh, 
We need to have a, a sense of God's holiness and then a sense of our own depravity. So that's the sinfulness of sin. And I, I'm leading off of that because I feel like that's, that's, that's one of our biggest weaknesses as a church. Not just as freedom church, but as churches all across our, our land and all around the world. We have forgotten the, um, the horror of offending a righteous and holy God. We have lost the shakiness of what it means to stand trembling in His presence, realizing that He is pure and that we are not. And that if not for Christ, who is our mediator, one can do with the God of man. If not for Him, we would be squashed like the mosquito or the bug in just an instant. So we have to recover that here, church, if we're going to grow in holiness, and certainly if we're going to stay in our culture in this day. So that is the sinfulness of sin. Now I want to talk uh, rather quickly about the nature of sin. What is so? What is sin in its nature? Well, the simple answer is just that sin is the breaking of God's law. Right? It's breaking God's law. It's doing what He says. And so I, I take for granted that you guys are familiar with that, that you're comfortable with that definition. Breaking God's law. That's, that's sin. But I want to go on and, and, and add to that and say that. Uh, Sin is not just breaking God's law, it's in turn making law for ourselves and deciding for ourselves what our law will be. And so I want you to, to turn to Genesis 3 with me. Um, everything begins in the first three chapters of the Bible. Um, so we return here often. So, so thankful to hear at Freedom Church because that happens all the time. Um, so here we are doing it again. So, Genesis 3, 1-7, The serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat any tree, eat of any tree in the garden? Of course, God hadn't actually said that. He's listening to God's word. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it. She's adding to that. God didn't say anything about that. Lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So see the lie there. He's, he's saying God doesn't want what is best for you, Eve and Adam. God is trying to keep something from you. He's trying to fence off this thing that could be really good for you. So there is the lie, and there is the temptation to sin. So, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, they knew that they were naked, and so fig leaves together and they made themselves one cause. Lots and lots of things here to talk about. The thing I want to zero in on is, is just see the way that not only did they break, God's law, they did disobey God's command not to eat of that tree, right? That's obvious. That's what we've all grown up seeing and knowing. Um, but notice too that with that sin, there is this law making that's going on. Eve and Adam there with her, standing passively by, I think he's in the recliner, right? He's just chilling out. She's having a conversation with Satan, and he's over here watching football, which Amen. I love to watch football. <laughs> because this is an illustration of passivity, right? And so anyway, she's over here. But what they decide is, in that act of breaking God's law, they're deciding, too, that they are going to make for themselves their own law. They're deciding what's right and wrong. They're going to call the shots for their lives. Yeah, yeah, God said this. But this talking snake seems to know what he's talking about. And this seems to offer a better way. And so we're going to go with this and we're going to decide what's best for our lives. And so it's not just that, the, that they broke God's law. It's that they in turn made up their minds and made up their own laws of right and wrong, what they're going to do. That's the other essence of sin. We do the same thing. I take it, many of you, most of you probably, that have grown up in, in church or you've been a part of Freedom Church for some time now, you're familiar at least with biblical morality, right? I mean, you, you know, you realize that Scripture says don't lie, right? Don't bear false witness, right? You know, guys, it says don't lust. Don't be 
commit adultery, but if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery within your heart, right? You, you know that. I, I'm trusting. So I'm assuming a little bit of biblical literacy, which maybe I shouldn't assume that, but you just got that for the first time, and then there you go. So I think most of us have a sense of what the biblical ethic is, what the biblical requirement is, but in the instances of sin, we're not just breaking God's law. We are doing that, but we are deciding for ourselves, you know what, I know what's best. And in this situation, I'm deciding that God does not know what's best for me, but I do. And that is the sneakiness of sin, the empowerment that comes from, from humanity that says, this is what I want. And we've got to kill the one by killing the other and first submitting all things to God. And so the nature of sin is first that we are not really making laws, but we are sorry, breaking that law, but we are making our own laws in their place. The, the second idea, and this comes from um, Cornelius Plantin, who I quoted earlier, is that we are rejecting God's order as the way things ought to be. We're deciding for ourselves the way things ought to be, rather than the way that God made them. And so he calls that shalom. This is the Hebrew word for peace. Uh, but it's more than just peace, as in like war and peace, right? This isn't just that kind of peace. It's harmony. It's fulfillment. It's total satisfaction and completion. That's the picture that Shalom gives. It's complete harmony and peace in the world. And so when we sin, when Adam and Eve sin, they were rejecting what God had established, the way he established his order. And so Plantinga says this, he says, God hates sin, not just because it violates his law, but more substantively, because it violates shalom, because it breaks the peace, because it interferes with the way things are supposed to be. And so we live in a world now that is far from shalom, right? We live in a world that is broken, that is uh, bruised, that is battered, that is sinful at every turn, right? Why do those awful things that I mentioned a little earlier, why does poverty happen? Why do, why do you have droughts? Why do you have um, famine? Why do you have tornadoes? Why do you have hurricanes? Why do you have disease? Well, all these things come as a result of all. Why do we have death? Even though we mourn this pearl. Like, why do we have death in this world? It's a, again, this world is not what it was supposed to be. Romans 8 beautifully describes it. It says the whole creation is groaning. It's longing, uh, longing for redemption. But even in that time, it's groaning in the pains of childbirth, the agony of that moment. And so we are all in a world that is not like it is supposed to be. And isn't that, that's, that's an awful reality, right? But isn't that an encouragement, again, for you as a Christian? So that when people come to you and they're like, why does this happen? Why is there evil in the world? We can say, we take the scripture to say, this isn't the way God made it. In the beginning, this was not so. This was not the way things were supposed to be. We live in a world that is far from shalom. Lastly, I just want to talk about types of sin. And I'm going to have to speed up here. But types of sin, um, there's kind of two main types. There are sins of commission, as we think about the nature of sin. There are sins of commission and think sins of omission. And I remember where I was actually in college, uh, sitting um, in a campus Bible study uh, we fellowship gathering, and this distinction finally hit me. And understanding the difference between sins of commission and omission caused me to realize, as a 20-something year old, that I was a whole lot worse off than I thought I was. Okay? And so if I do that this morning for you, I'm sorry. But actually, I'm not sorry. Because um, you need to know. Um, so sins of commission, those are things like our deeds, right? Those are the things that we do. And so again, think like Ten Commandments style. Don't murder, right? Don't commit adultery. Don't steal, right? Those are all things that we do. Right? Don't make an idol, right? Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't gossip. And if you want to just boil it down that way, that's, those are things that we do. And so those things are sinful. And probably nothing I just said is a surprise to you. But, and then it also extends not just those things that we actively do, but those things that we think, like I just referenced a minute ago. And so to lust for a man or a woman in our mind and in our heart, we've already committed adultery with her in our, our hearts and in our minds. And so we, we were guilty of, of adultery, God says, that we've done that. says that if you call your brother, you think about your brother, and you say, you fool, you idiot, you moron, how could you cut me off in traffic? How could you try to rip me off that way? Or whatever that anger is. He says, if you have been angry with your brother, then you're guilty of murder. This is Jesus saying this in Matthew 5. 
uh, 20, uh, 22 is, is where that is, so look that up. Um, and so, again, I'm realizing when I'm hearing this stuff, I'm like, man, I'm a lot worse off than I thought I was. I was a bad dude, but I'm worse than I ever guessed, right? So the things that we do, the things that we think, and not just that, but then the things that we omit, these are the sins of omission. And so God says, Deuteronomy 6, you shall, this is the Shema, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, right? And so, and then Jesus expands upon that in Matthew 22. He says, and the second greatest commandment is like it. You shall love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. And so what I began to realize is, wait a minute. So if I've not loved God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, then I am a sinner. How many of you this morning want to raise your hand and say, this morning, since I woke up, 30 minutes that we've been in Sunday school, I have loved God with my heart, soul, strength, right? Yeah, so I saw your hand back there, but you were stretching out the microphone. Not really. <laughs> so, right, and none of us would raise our hand and say that, right? None of us are that person. And that's something even you see in the 10th commandment where it says, do not covet, right? Covet, sorry, that's, sorry, never mind, that's a sin of, of thought. That's, let's go back to that. Oh, omission, you with me on omission? The things that we ought to do with the things that we fail to do, even though we ought to. Them. Those are the sins of omission. Lastly, I want to just talk about the universality of sin. The universality of sin. The key text for this, we're not gonna, we're not gonna expose it this. Next week, by the way, you get to talk about sin again. Uh, but you're talking about the nature and the, the consequence of sin. So maybe we will we'll cover some um, in Romans 3 next week. Um, but just as I, as I wrap up here, um, I want to read for you Isaiah 53, um, verse 6. And then maybe bounce around a few more places. And help you to see that. Sin is a universal problem. It's a universal problem. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, there's all of that, right? All means all. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 64. Verse 6, it says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And then we can go to begin Romans 3. The verse that you know most clearly from Romans 3, I suspect, is verse 23, which says that all have sinned, right, and fall short of God's warrior standard. The preceding things that come before that in chapter 3 are even worse. Uh, so I'll let you do that or read that on your own. Maybe Luke will go into that uh, next week for you. But the reality is, is that sin is totalitizing. It is, it is global. It is universal. And then as we read that, just that line from the Belgian Confession a little earlier, our whole nature is totally, completely corrupt. There is nothing good in us whatsoever. And so that's true for every single person that's ever been born, with the exception of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and so, why would we spend time on what might seem to be a depressing subject? Why would we spend time? Why would John Stott take two chapters in this book on basic Christianity and talk about sin? Well, it's because you can't, if you don't understand the diagnosis, if you, if you don't understand the problem, then you'll never understand the cure, nor will you want the cure, nor will you appreciate the cure, right? I've not personally uh, been through cancer, right? But I've walked with people who have, and many of you have, and some of you are walking through it now. Right? And so chemotherapy is a ugly, horrible thing, right? It's basically taking poison. I've heard doctors actually say that. Well, we're going to give you this, and we're trying to kill part of your body. So chemotherapy is an awful thing. But what would motivate a person to take chemotherapy? Well, I've got cancer, and if I don't take this, then I will die. I want to live. And so unless you understand that diagnosis, then you'll never understand the glory of the gospel. You'll never understand the richness of what God has done for us in Christ. And so we've got to understand sin before we can understand anything else in the Christian life. And so I want to close about being hopefully just a little bit encouraging after a heavy, intense lesson. I want to read for you Psalm 130. It's one of my favorite psalms. Listen to the psalmist as he cries out. He says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the verse of my pleas, for a voice of my pleas for mercy. 
verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? So this picture of God marking my sins on the chalkboard. Right? Let's talk about the illustration of, of writing in all your sins on like a notes document in your, in your iPhone, right? Or Evernote or somewhere. A huge list of your sins. If you, O God, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But look at verse 4, church. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, I would say, O church, hope in the Lord. For the Lord there is steadfast love. With Him plentiful redemption. It's plentiful redemption. And He will redeem Israel. He will redeem His people from all. There. And so that is the hope of all who know Christ is that He will redeem us from our iniquities, as vile and heinous as they are. I want to close by reading a prayer. We don't maybe often do that. Uh, but this is from a great book of Puritan prayers called The Valley of Vision. So if you your heads with me and close, uh, I'm going to read this. It's called The Precious Blood. Mm -hmm. Blessed Lord Jesus, before your cross we kneel and we see the heinousness of our sin. We see our iniquity that caused you to be made a curse. We see the evil that excites the severity of divine wrath. Lord, by your grace, show us the enormity of our guilt by the crown of thorns, the pierced hands and feet, the bruised body, the dying cross. Your blood is the blood of incarnate God. Its worth is infinite. Its value beyond all thought. Infinite must mean evil and guilt that demands such a price. Sin, O oh Lord, is our malady, it's our monster, it's our foe, it is our viper. Sin was born in our birth, it's alive in our lives, strong in our characters, dominating in our faculties, follows us as a shadow, it mingles with our every thought. It is our chain that holds us captive in the empire of our souls. Sinners that we are, why should the sun give us light? Why should the air supply breath and the earth bear our tread? Its fruits, the fruits of earth, nourish us. Why should earth's creatures subserve our ends? And yet, O oh God, your compassions yearn over us. Your heart hastens to our rescue. Your love endured our curse. Your mercy bore our deserved stripes. So therefore, Lord, let us walk humbly in the lowest depths of humiliation, bathed in your blood, tender of conscience, triumphing gloriously as an heir of salvation. We pray this in the strong name of our Lord and Savior.